In case you weren't aware, there is a crisis in cosmology right now. And I use the term crisis very loosely there. Essentially, we have two main methods for working out the rate that the universe is expanding at. And over the past couple of decades, as instruments and techniques for doing that have gotten better and better, those measurements have got more and more accurate. But the estimates from those two methods have also diverged from each other to the point where they completely disagree. Now there's a 2% uncertainty on each measurement, but a 10% difference between them. Now there's been a lot of effort in the past couple of years to try and resolve this crisis, this tension between these two measurements, a lot of which I've covered on this channel before. So some of you might remember me saying this in a video back from July, 2021. But then also the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna help as well. Another thing on the James Webb Space Telescope's shoulders, you know, the crisis in cosmology is now resting there as well. And a few weeks ago, back in November, 2022, we finally got a sneak peek of what we've been waiting for with this paper by Yuan and collaborators describing some new observations from JWST of Cepheid variable stars. So to understand all of this, we're gonna chat a little bit about what the crisis on cosmology is, the two methods to measure it, and why JWST will hopefully solve it. So let's recap the two methods used to get this measurement of the expansion rate. One that uses the cosmic microwave background, and one that uses supernova observations. Let's start with the supernova, because this is where the Cepheid variable stars that JWST has observed come in. So in 1905, Henrietta Swan Leavitt was studying variable stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a small satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, which you can actually see in the Southern Hemisphere sky. Now, Leavitt discovered a correlation for Cepheid variable stars between the maximum brightness they have and the period at which they pulse at. So that meant if you found a Cepheid variable star and you measured its period, you would know what brightness it should be. And then from how bright it appeared, like how faint it got, you could work out what distance it was at. That meant we finally had a way to measure the distances to nearby galaxies, as long as you could find a Cepheid variable star in that galaxy. What this is, is the first sort of rung on the ladder to figuring out distances in the universe. All distances that we measure in the universe rest on this first measurement of the distances to nearby galaxies where you can resolve individual Cepheid variable stars. For example, for more distant galaxies, we use supernovae to calculate how distant they are. We use type 1a supernova to do this, which always go off with the exact same brightness. So again, from how bright or faint they appear to us, you can then work out how far away that galaxy is. In the same way that, you know, if you're crossing the road at night, you judge how far away a car is by how bright its headlights appear. But the only reason you can do that is because you know how bright car headlights are when they're right next to you. And in, in the same way, we know how bright the supernova should be because we know the distance to the ones that are in galaxies that also contain Cepheid variable stars. What supernovae allow you to do is measure the expansion rate of the universe. So once you've got the distance to these very distant galaxies, you can then make a plot of distance against redshift of the light, i.e. how fast the galaxy that has the supernova in it is moving away from us. And if you plot this out, you get this really nice correlation between distance and redshift that essentially says the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us, i.e. the universe is expanding. And it's the slope of this correlation line that tells us the rate of expansion of the universe, i.e. how much bigger it's getting with every, say, light year distance that you go. That's method one of measuring the rate of expansion using supernova. Method two is to observe the cosmic microwave background. This is the first light ever produced in the universe. It's a glow of light only visible in long radio wavelengths of light coming from every direction in the sky, from when the universe was only 370,000 years old, when light all of a sudden could travel through the universe because atoms formed and took the universe from opaque to transparent. And the temperature of the universe at that time is imprinted on that light that we detect. 
So the blue areas of this radio light image show colder areas of hydrogen gas in the early universe, and red areas show where the gas was much hotter. Now it's those colder regions that will eventually have got dense enough to collapse under gravity to form the first stars and galaxies. So what you can do is try and take all the laws of physics that you know and try and model how those tiny fluctuations in temperature of the gas could lead to the structure of the universe that we see around us today. And you do that by modeling for all the different properties of the universe, like for example, the ratio of matter that's pulling everything in due to gravity and the energy that's pushing outwards due to the expansion of the universe, something we call dark energy. And so you can run that model for all different combinations of possibilities of all of those different parameters, but your best fit model is the one that matches the data of the cosmic microwave background and the universe that we see around us today. So the sizes and shapes and distribution of galaxies and how spread out they are. From that, you can then get the best fit rate of expansion of the universe. So that's method two. And as we know, it doesn't match with method one that uses supernova observations to get at the rate of expansion. Now this could be due to a whole host of things. There's so many different ideas pinging around, a lot of which I've talked about on this channel before. Again, I'll link some videos in the video description below if you're interested. You know, especially considerations between is the local universe and the distant universe very different, perhaps they have different properties. But the two main explanations that keep coming up time and time again to explain this are, number one, our best model of the universe is wrong. Maybe we've missed something out, some property of the universe or some component of the universe that we still don't know about. And that would be really exciting if that was true because we'd learn so much more new physics. Option two is that there's something wrong with our distance measurements that all rely on that Cepheid variable relation of brightness and period. Now, the last time I covered the crisis in cosmology on my channel, back in July 2021, it was looking like the second explanation was going to be more likely, that there was something wrong with the distance measurements from Cepheid variable stars. This was work done by Wendy Freeman, who showed that if you used another way of measuring nearby distances, using something called the tip of the red giant branch stars, and instead use that to get your nearby distances, which then calibrate the distances to the galaxies that you found supernova in, then some of this tension disappeared. It brought the measurements closer together, so close that it was no longer statistically interesting. That suggested that it was this Cepheid calibration that was the issue. Now, one explanation for that is that the calibration could be biased bright, i.e. when measuring the brightness of these Cepheid variable stars, brighter than they actually are, perhaps because they overlap with another star, either because it's close to it or just because of the fact that one's in the foreground and one's in the background, and we can't separate the two to work out which light is from the Cepheid variable and which light is from this background or foreground star. You know, telescopes are limited by how small a thing they can resolve by the size of the mirror that collects the light. There actually comes a point where if there's two stars close together, they blend into one. So the suspicion has always been that while the Hubble Space Telescope does give us great data, it's still limited, and this could be the problem. Now, Anderson and Reese looked at this back in 2018 with the best Hubble Space Telescope data we had in the most nearby galaxy in Andromeda, where the stars are closer and you've got a better chance of resolving them. But they said if you took everything into account, this overlap issue only accounted for an overestimate on the rate of the expansion by a mean easily 0.23%. But that was still only in one galaxy and the Hubble Space Telescope data, even at Andromeda's distance, is still limited. Ideally, what you do is test this in a load of galaxies with a much bigger telescope with a better resolution, like JWST. Now there is a project which will be completed in JWST's first year of observations that's led by Wendy Freeman that's going to look at 11 nearby galaxies and measure the distance to them using three different methods. The Cepheid variable method, the tip of the red giant branch, and also using carbon stars. 
What they'll then do is then use those three different methods of calculating those nearby distances to recalibrate the supernova distances three different times and then work out three different rate of expansion of the universe, some of the most accurate measurements we'll ever have had, and then be able to say, okay, is there an issue with the Cepheid variable stars and the distances that we're getting from them? Now, only one of their galaxies has been observed so far. It was back on the 5th of November. So 10 more still to go in that project before we get some answers. But it just so happens that one of the galaxies on their list, NGC 1365, had been observed for another JWST project with NIRCAM, the imaging detector on board, that wanted to measure the star formation rate in that galaxy. Something that JWST is great for because it can just, you know, peer through all the dust that blocks a lot of the younger stars in a galaxy. But the region of the galaxy that was observed also happened to overlap with the Hubble observation of the outskirts of that galaxy, where 38 Cepheid variables and a supernova had been found, making it a very useful test for if this Cepheid variable distance measurement is biased bright because of this overlap of stars, if we just don't have the resolution with the Hubble Space Telescope, but we do with JWST. And so that was what was noticed by Yuan and collaborators. And so they managed to do sort of like a first look with this data. Now it was data that wasn't specifically taken for this science case. Ideally, you would have had longer exposures and you would have taken the image through a slightly different wavelength filter as well, but it still allowed you to do like a preliminary look at it while we wait for all of the other data for the main project that's gonna look at this to come through. And they found, drum roll please, no difference at all. <sighs> Here's the relation that they found between the period and the brightness for Cepheid variables observed with JWST in the red points and with the Hubble Space Telescope HST in the gray points. Now you can see when HST and JWST both observe the same Cepheid variable, there might be some small change in the brightness there, but not enough to change that overall correlation that gives you the distance. In fact, the slopes of the correlation that they measure fit to the two different data sets are almost identical. To account for that huge discrepancy in the two different ways of measuring the rate of expansion, the Hubble Space Telescope measurements of the brightness of those Cepheid variables would have to be 0.2 magnitudes brighter than the ones measured by JWST. Biased brighter. Shifting that relation that's fit to the Hubble Space Telescope Cepheid data by 0.2 magnitudes, which we clearly don't see here. So that's put the cat amongst the pigeons, hasn't it? Now, again, this data wasn't taken for this specific science case, so there's a lot of nuances here. Plus, this only looked at the Cepheids. It didn't look at those three other different ways of measuring the distances that would actually tell you maybe JWST's Cepheid variable measurements are also still biased in some way. So I'm really intrigued to see what that program that's designed to thoroughly test this will actually find. And hopefully we should know more about the results from that in maybe mid next year in 2023. If you want to keep an eye on the public observing schedules that are published each week for galaxies in this project, you should look for the number 1995 in the visit ID column on the left hand side, which is the ID of this specific project. But if that project reveals the same things that you and in collaborators have found here with this preliminary work that suggests that these Cepheid variables aren't bias bright in any way, it could mean that there's something wrong with our best model of the universe. Which if that was the case, which we can't get ahead of ourselves just yet because, you know, there's so many other avenues to check first. But if that was the case, it would be so exciting because we'd learn so much more new physics when we finally cracked it. Before we get to the bloopers, I just wanna say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you wanna learn more about cosmology and the basics that underpin a lot of the ideas that we've talked about in this video, then Brilliant is for you. Brilliant is a website and an app with a huge range of interactive courses across science, maths, and computer science that immerse you in a topic so that you learn by doing. I 
absolutely love their astrophysics course, just for how much ground it covers, especially in its cosmology section, which covers basic principles about the universe and, of course, the cosmic microwave background that underpins one of those methods of calculating the expansion rate of the universe that we talked about in this video. So if you want to get stuck in learning more about cosmology, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. That link is also in the video description down below and you can sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 of you to go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. At that link, you'll also find my curated learning path for you with all of the courses that cover the topics that we chat about in my videos. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now roll those bloopers. Now one explanation for that is could, now one explanation for that is could be, now one explanation for that is could be, it could be, it's not a sentence, Becky, stop trying to say it. <laughs> but they concluded that that only accounted for an overestimate of the rate by a Weasley Norp, Weasley? <laughs> Weasley. Ugh, my brain does stupid things. Ronald Weasley, how dare you steal that car? Remart is a Christmas tree farm where the crisis in cosmology has already been figured out. And also working out, is there any issues with, with? <laughs> Which the Cephid, I think I just like completely skipped out the most important parts of the words. Not a blue, but just a quick reminder that you can get really cool JD West tea merch from my merch store. The link is down in the video description below. And my new book, A Brief History of Black Holes, makes a pretty good Christmas present for all of the space lovers in your life. Again, it's linked in the video description down below if you want to grab a copy.